Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jerry Taylor. Really glad to have Michael Oliver with me again as we round out 2017. And uh, that website that you should all go to, consider subscribing to Michael's letter. It's olivermsa.com, olivermsa.com. Welcome, Michael. Hi, Jay. Good to be back. Always good to have you back. I just have to ask you about Bitcoin. Its exponential rise seems to be thwarted, at least for the time being. What, what, are, your, uh, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Well, our thoughts were, uh, and we were very fortunate, the Wall Street Journal even picked up on them. Um, before mm-hmm. the future started trading, which was last week, uh, we said, wait for the futures to start trading because it, not so much technically speaking because Bitcoin doesn't have that much history and it's hard mm-hmm. for us to do technical analysis of something that basically is a, it, it's an infant. Okay, it, it doesn't even have DNA yet. But I remembered when gold was legalized. It had had a multi-year bull market in the early 70s from $35. It was reaching 200 as it was legalized in the U.S. in 1975. And as soon as it was legalized, it topped. And it suffered a year and a half downside and about a 50% correction before it then reasserted itself into a massive bull market. But sure enough, last week, Bitcoin... Um, uh, we took a, a cash chart for, I think, Bitfinex was the most liquid of the cash exchanges. There's a lot of quotes out there. And when, then we stuck on the Chicago Merck price action last week. Well, Chicago Merck took over where uh, Bitfinex had ended in just short of 20000 shot up to, I think, 20600 something like that, and collapsed yeah. to 12200 <laughs> It closed out the week, uh, I think, at 14000 or so. So, but the, from high to the low of the week last week was 40, over 40% drop. Wow. So it couldn't have been more, sort of, so to speak, reflective of gold, but even then more so. Why? Because there was a venue for people who might want to short it, to short it in a way that they could feel comfortable, know it's a, a mechanism that works, it's a surefire thing, you know, the futures market, uh, and so forth. So that, that brought in the other side, the guys who said, listen, this has gone too far. Um, now the question is what happens in the future, and I don't know. There's not a lot of technical history for us to develop trend behavior off of, to study the momentum of. Anything we do would be short-term, pretty much. And I suspect that in the long run it will survive. Uh, one or more of them will survive as you know, valid alternatives to fiat currencies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that yeah. therefore it's... It's a wake-up call, so to speak, that uh, especially the young generation, you know, the millennials, have just discovered that you don't have to be a government to have a money uh, a medium of exchange. <laughs> yeah. So, which is a, a rude uh, awareness for a lot of people, uh, especially the central bankers. So if uh, these things take root over the next few years in terms of uh, percentage of global transactions that occur with uh, cryptocurrencies, they become a threat to... Uh, the monopoly currencies. So yeah. uh, that'd be interesting. Yeah, it sure will be. I mean, I'm, I'm sure uh, one of the things that Bitcoin can do is move wealth, move move money around, uh, yeah. uh, and do it with less friction. Um, and so you eliminate the middleman, and I can understand why the banks bankers might be nervous wanting to get a piece mm-hmm. of that action, if not own it completely. But uh, we, we shall hope that they're not successful. At least that's my editorial viewpoint. Um, well, that's, that's interesting that this is uh, almost the same kind of decline percentage-wise as gold had back in, uh, you that, know, when it shot up to 850. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, exactly, and, and gold yeah. was a more protracted, as I, although it yeah. was, as I recall very vividly, a very, a very uh, fast, rapid smackdown, too, from 850. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just at 850 only very briefly. Uh, so very well, interesting, that's, that's though, because that's the next bull market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was talking about the one that peaked in '75 at 200 bucks, and it yeah. came down to 103. That was, a, but it peaked when futures were legalized, and that that made sense. You know, if sure, I could look at it. But uh, meanwhile, gold's doing doing good this week. Um, yeah, uh, we're gonna had, we're gonna. I think we're gonna get we're gonna see you for the third time this year, very possibly, Michael. You uh, well, you called that within a whisker. You came within a whisker of your line in the sand two times before, bounced off, and never never had to go neutral. And it looks like maybe you're gonna. That's going to happen again. Yeah, I think this week sort of put its elbow up over the shoulder of, uh, of the, the curb stone, and I think that the sell off you, you saw over the last uh, month or so is over. 
The issue now is well, what does it do now and, and at what speed? And we'll be doing a lot of work that on the, uh, this weekend, especially because we get a lot of new numbers. It's the end of the year. It's the end of the quarter. Mm-hmm. A lot of numbers change, and we'll do a lot of reassessing of some of the major markets, including gold. Though I suspect gold is uh, the most obvious level now is a price-based level. It's around 1350 uh, anybody with a crayon and a ruler can plot a monthly price chart or a weekly going back years. So you go back three or four years and you'll find there's a gradual line of resistance that comes through such that if you'll close a week out, about 1350, you've cleared it. And then the price crowd will wake up and say, hey, it's a bull market. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the momentum well, crowd, or our, our folks, uh, knew it was a bull market in early 2016. But it, it's, it's done its typical congestion stuff after its first major surge off of its bare lows, it went into a lot of volatile congestion and it shook a lot of people out. And uh, that's good because uh, that means that the market's leaner and meaner. Uh, it doesn't have so many weak longs in it now. That, yeah, uh, good. Hopefully a lot of folks got stopped out. Good entry point probably yeah. for those that aren't in it. Makes it healthier. Yeah, indeed. Um, well, you're going to be having a lot of new material uh, coming out, as you say, the end of the year, end of the quarter, etc. Uh, and uh, it's OliverMSA.com, folks, to learn more and, and catch up with Michael and subscribe to his letter. I'm looking forward, Michael, to, to talking to you next week uh, as well about some of these major trends, your plate tectonics, so to speak, uh, how you see the markets uh, evolving as we go into the new year. And I guess that's a good time to reflect on it after you have all the annual annual numbers, mm-hmm. right? Yes, so, the numbers change. So, so you you've been calling for a bull market and uh, all year and year last year even uh, for commodities. You've seen the the, the turning point, uh, and copper right now looks particularly strong. Um, I saw it was three twenty eight a pound before we went on the air. Uh, how do you see copper, and how do you see well, uh, Freeport uh, McMoran? You you recently done some work on Freeport McMoran. Well, we we uh, like Freeport in the fourteen. So I think it's now eighteen something. Uh, in two weeks, it did more on the upside than the S&P did all year. Uh, wow. <clears throat> anyway, that's what the nature of uh, overly suppressed markets, <laughs> which is true with a lot of commodities. Now, copper fits in the category of with oil, where the percent recovery from the lows has been substantial already. Not that it can't go a lot further, but it, this percent recovery has been very strong. We turned bullish on copper at $2.24 in November last year. And like you said, it's... Uh, dollar above there now, which is a, a nice move. Uh, but next year, I think that the real big power move is going to come out of the grains, yeah. corn, beans, uh, corn, beans, and uh, wheat. And I think by power move, I mean the initial breakout, and it's not far away from levels right now that if you're there in 2018 in soybeans, corn, and wheat, just uh, I, we've got specific numbers uh, not far up above the current market, that the first whoosh out of the holes for these markets could be of the uh, about 40%, and we think it could be rapid and uh, like a thin air rally, you know, where it just it unleashes, it changes its nature. And that, on a percent basis, I think that may be the most exciting place to be next year once our numbers are triggered in terms of one, speed of the move and the percent of the move. Um, mm-hmm. And that combination should be quite headline-grabbing. Uh, and also we'll broaden out the commodity upside that we've seen this past year, which we saw in oil, we've seen in copper, seen it in gold, and so forth. But uh, when you take the food commodities, and I would throw cattle in there too, uh, you throw them upstairs, suddenly you've got a, a full chorus. You, you don't just have half the markets moving up, taking the Bloomberg Commodity Index up, but uh, you've got the full, full force, and I think that's about to happen. Yeah, um, well, certainly if the commodity complex continues to rise, especially the food items and so forth, those are those are things that really come into play in the uh, CPI, the government's numbers. Uh, it, it would seem to go well with your other viewpoint uh, concerning the the, um, the interest rates and the debt markets, right? You're seeing right. debt I, markets I next year. In fact, the charts, if you look at an annual momentum chart of, uh, let's say, the German bonds or the Japanese government bonds, and it, they look equally as ripe to collapse as the grains do to explode. Uh, and the, the fact that they're both postured in the same way, equals and opposites, almost makes the point. It's, it's when the food commodities go up, suddenly it becomes obvious. Uh, you know, people can ex- uh, ignore a copper rise because they don't eat, eat copper. 
<laughs> but when all of a sudden the price of uh, grains goes up 40% in the heartbeat, uh, first leg, that is, uh, and, and so forth, then it gets your attention uh, globally speaking. It gets the public attention and government's attention, which puts a, uh, you know, it's a shen kick to the bond markets, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. The excuse that, well, we need to get some inflation before we can, uh, well, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be careful what you ask for, right? Yeah, and, be careful um, what you ask for. Yeah, well, well for sure. Uh, on, on the commodity play, I mean, uh, one ETF that you've talked about before, and I think you've just recently done some more work on it, is MOO, M-O-O as a symbol. I guess it's mm-hmm. uh, what it's, it's uh, agricultural it's, uh, chemicals yeah, agricultural as well as industry. Grains. That's the beauty yeah. of it, and it has really yeah. launched this year. We we uh, went long at the same time we went long EEM the emerging markets back in January, and Moo has had a heck of a move. I can't tell you exact percent right now, but Moo is comprised of not the commodities themselves, but companies that uh, service the agricultural industry, everything from Monsanto to the fertilizer companies. Uh, even deer tractor and so forth, but things that are related to servicing the agricultural industry. Uh, and these stocks didn't wait for grains to take off before they went up. They had a big move this year. And mm-hmm. I think it's, a, in effect, a, a forestatement of what, you know, some investors see as what's coming in the grains themselves. I think it's a forewarning. So, uh, yeah, we, we like that sector of the stock market, and we think uh, you could probably be long the move, the agricultural industry stocks, as a basket, although we like the fertilizer stocks more, particularly potash, which we went long a while ago, uh, mm. and be short the S&P simultaneously and make good money on the spread. Mm-hmm. You know, where oh. you're effectively market neutral, so, so to speak, but uh, uh, you're betting on the difference widening where Moo is favored and S&P is disfavored. Right, so you could buy Moo and sell S, uh, and buy SH, I suppose. ETFs, yeah, that's that'd right. be one simple that's way to order. play it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, I'm looking. At, I'm looking at Moo now, and I see it was uh, trading uh, starting the year about. A, I guess this is a 52 week range here. Mm-hmm. It was at 51.09 a year ago. It's at 61.54 now. So pretty good move. Right. You think it still has a lot more to it, possibly? I think it does, but it, it will re- in, it, it will have downside with the market because it is part of the market, so to speak. It's not totally separate. Therefore, if the S and P dropped, though, you know, seven eight percent at some point, which we actually kind of think might happen in the first quarter, uh, I wouldn't be shocked that the uh, move pulls back, you know, about half of that. But again, mm-hmm. what you're betting on here at this point in time is not the net trend to move, but the spread relationship. The spread, right. These stocks, just simply, if the S&P goes into a bear market, I don't just mean a quick correction, but an actual bear market, the move resists it quite well. And mm-hmm. especially so once the grains get moving. At that sure. point, it'll give move even more uh, solidity, if you know what I mean. So, um, I... I like that as a spread right now. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. Michael, with about a, a minute left, just uh, getting back to uh, freeport Macmoran, uh, do you think that one has uh, got yeah, some I, more I on the upside? It's made quite a move already this year. The easy money has already been made, perhaps. No, no, I don't think so. I think uh, the breakout you just had that took you up to 18 plus uh, from our breakout point was 14 on momentum, and then you've just surged to 18 rapidly. Uh, I looked at it uh, this morning, um, and again, and w- with an attempt to come up with an idea of where might its first major objective be, and I could easily see it seeing a double from here mm-hmm. before you do right. anything sub- substantial in terms of resistance. Uh, in the next six months or a year, well, perhaps? Well, I don't know about that, but in the next year or so. I, you know, and, okay. I, and that is a stock I would not treat as uh, coincident with the S&P. While the moon might back up with the S&P to some extent spread still work favoring the move. I think that something like Freeport Macmoran would, 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 would even care what the S&P is doing. Yeah, uh, could be. It's, it's got gold and copper both. So. Yes, right. We'll have to leave it go at that, Michael. Thank you so much. I look forward to talking to you next week if you're available and uh, yes, give sure. your outlook for 2018 on the major plate tectonics. So thanks again Thank for you, being Jay. with us. Always a pleasure Thank having you, you Michael. Michael. 